After the Second World War, a series of trials took place to bring the main perpetrators of the German war crimes to justice. The most high-profile trials took place at Nuremberg, with the remaining members of Hitler's high command seeing justice. At the trial, footage of the concentration camps was shown as evidence to the defendants, and it shocked everyone inside of the courtroom. Images of incredible suffering were shown, and the largest concentration camp established was at Auschwitz. Auschwitz was split into three main camps, Auschwitz I, the main labour part of the camp, Auschwitz II, Birkenau, the main extermination centre, and Auschwitz III, Monowitz, the IG Farben factory. Inside of Auschwitz, over 1.1 million people lost their lives, being victims to the Nazis, and people from all around the world found themselves starved and systematically killed inside of the barbed wire fences. It became the major site of the final solution, and when it was liberated it showed the horror of the Third Reich. Stories emerged of brutal guards who would treat prisoners with sadism and barbarism. Many were killed through medical experiments, disease, exhaustion, starvation, execution, beatings and inside of the gas chambers, the methods selected to exterminate masses. One story that emerged from Auschwitz, however, was the fact that inside of the hell on earth, British prisoners of war were brought to Auschwitz and were put to work. This is a story of the British prisoners of Auschwitz, and as always to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Auschwitz is a place synonymous with mass murder, genocide and the evils of the Nazi regime. Inside of the camp complex were a number of subcamps that were established to hold different prisoners. The satellite or subcamps were named Außenlanger, or external camps, Arbeitslanger, labour camps, or Nebenslager, extension or subcamps. They varied in their size, some holding thousands of prisoners, and others holding dozens. The prisoners inside of these camps had different tenants, who utilised the workforces within them. For example, one subcamp, Reisko, was used for SS research, one was even used for making shoes. Different corporations used the work detachments to fill out their workforce, to ultimately make money, and most of these industries contributed to the Nazi war effort. One of these camps that was attached to Auschwitz was E-715, a prisoner of war camp that was created for British prisoners of war. This was then staffed and was guarded by members of the German army, the Wehrmacht, and was a subcamp of Stalagate B. E-715 was attached to the Monowitz Auschwitz III concentration camp, which was codenamed Buna, as it made synthetic rubber. It was one of 28 other subcamps under the banner of Auschwitz III, where the SS had control. E715 was found right next to the IG Farben chemical plant, and was very close to the entrance of Monowitz. Much of what we know that occurred at E715 comes from the accounts of Arthur Dodd, a soldier who found himself inside of Auschwitz and the camp. He was captured along with thousands of other soldiers following the Battle of Tobruk, and had suffered inside of overcrowded Italian POW camps. He had been dispatched to fight against Rommel in the desert, and in his first action he came under tank and machine gun fire, but was captured by the Germans. He spent six months in a camp in Italy, and he was then dispatched to work in Nazi-run quarries and pits in Austria, Czechoslovakia, Germany and Poland. He and other British men refused to help the Germans, and refused to go down a mine, but were beaten with rifle butts. After this they were then crammed onto a train, and deported to a small town west of Krakow, and they were then taken to Auschwitz. Upon approaching Auschwitz, Arthur Dodd and other British POWs first noted the freezing cold, and also the stench of the camp. It was said that you could see the smoke coming from the chimneys, then as you got off the cattle trucks at the gates, there was this terrible meaty smell that got into your clothes, in your nose as well. You could not get rid of it. I'll never forget it. The British were then marched by German soldiers to their barrack building, but on this short journey, Dodd saw a young Jewish girl being beaten by an SS officer who was using his pistol as a weapon. She was suffering badly, and for the British who saw it this was too much and shocking, and they tried to allegedly stop this before they were threatened with German rifles. Another step forward and they would be shot. The guard allegedly continued to beat the girl, even stronger, and she was never seen again. The first 200 British POWs came to Auschwitz in September 1943, and more arrived 
around 1400 over the course of winter. Many were eventually transferred to other camps, but what they saw at the camp was disgusting. Most of the prisoners were forced to work in machine shops, and they were used to make pipes and repair equipment inside of the chemical plant. At first, life for them was more lenient than the other prisoners. The day began at five, with a Jewish orchestra playing as trains arrived at the camp. Thousands of people would be executed straight away, being sent to the gas chambers during the selection processes. Unlike the Jewish prisoners, the British were put to skilled work, and were kept and fed in slightly better conditions. It was said with regards to the food, if you could call a bit of liquid they called soup, with some mouldy carrot at the bottom food, and sometimes this came with small chunks of black bread made from chestnuts, which allegedly tasted like sawdust. The men dropped weight very quickly because of this. It was said by Dodd that, the Jews had it far worse of course, we used to give them our Red Cross parcels containing chocolate, butter, tinned ham and bullied beef. They could speak to us in broken English, and they'd hide the food inside of the toilets at the factory. It was the best we could do. Dodd himself worked inside of the rubber plant, and one day he saw Oskar Schindler arrive at Auschwitz, looking for more Jews to work inside his factory. He initially saw Schindler as a profiteer, but later changed his mind once a story came out about him saving Jews. The Nazis pressed their workforce to become more efficient, and through pushing the workers too hard, often many were killed. Inside of the plant, the British POWs often sabotaged the equipment and pipes that they were working on, putting stones into them. At one point, a German engineer ordered a pressure test on the pipes, and the prisoners knew not one pipe would pass a test, and that they would be shot. As the test was being performed, an air raid siren went off, and Dodd stated, We knew that they'd found out what we had done. They had us lined up against a wall to shoot us as soon as the pipes failed the test. I had just said a prayer, when the air raid siren went, and everyone, guards and prisoners, dived into air raid shelters. We heard a bomb fall, and when the raid was over, we saw that the only bomb to hit the factory had blown out the wall where the pipes were. God was looking after us that day. After the air raid, all of the pipes had been destroyed with a bomb hitting the place where the test was taking place. A later air raid hit a shelter where British prisoners of war were, and killed 38 of them, injuring Dodds. Inside of E-17, there was often the smell of burning flesh from the crematorium nearby at Auschwitz too. It was common for the British to see the evil treatment of Jews, and also the killing of them by SS guards, hanging Jews from the gallows of Auschwitz, and they also saw Jews being pushed off high scaffolding and structures, plunging to their deaths at the hands of the Nazis. There was allegedly one incident where a number of British prisoners of war saw a Jewish prisoner pushed into a cement pit to his death by an SS guard, and it was then said that the next day, a man from Yorkshire disguised himself as a Jewish prisoner, and then did exactly the same to the SS guard, taking revenge. In late 1944, the British heard noise coming from their huts, and when they went outside they saw a thousand Jews, old men, women and children, walking towards Auschwitz II, outside of the barbed wire. The children were playing and many were singing, but the British knew where they were going, being sent on a death march, where many would be killed en route to another camp away from the approaching Red Army. To keep up spirits at times, many of the British played football, and they came up with a team named the E-175 team, named after a specific hut in their barracks. Sergeant Charles Coward, known as the Count of Auschwitz, was a British soldier who allegedly rescued Jews from Auschwitz, and also claimed to have smuggled himself into the camp one night. He later testified about his experiences inside of the subcamp E-715. He gained a significant amount of trust in the camp, due to his understanding of German, and became a Red Cross liaison officer for the 1400 British prisoners. He was allowed to move freely throughout the camp, and to also visit other towns because of this. Coward was also able to pass messages to the British War Office, on conditions of the POWs, and other prisoners telling of the trainloads of Jews arriving at the camp. Coward stated at a war crimes trial, I made a point to get to one of the guards to take me to a town, under the excuse of buying new razor blades and stuff for our boys. For a few cigarettes he pointed out to me, the various places where they had gas chambers, and the places where they took them to be cremated. Everyone to whom I spoke gave the same story. The people in the town of Auschwitz, the SS men, concentration camp inmates, foreign workers, 
everyone said that thousands of people were being gassed and cremated at Auschwitz, and that the inmates who worked with us were unable to continue working because of their physical condition and were suddenly missing, and they had been sent to the gas chambers. The inmates who were selected to be gassed went through the procedure of preparing for a bath. They stripped their clothes off and walked into the bathing room. Instead of showers there was gas, all the camp knew it, all the civilian population knew it. I mixed with the civilian population at Auschwitz. I was at Auschwitz nearly every day. Nobody could live in Auschwitz and work in the plant, or even come down to the plant without knowing what was common knowledge to everybody. Even while still at Auschwitz we got radio broadcasts from the outside, speaking about the gassings and burnings at Auschwitz. I recall one of these broadcasts was by Anthony Eden himself. Also there were pamphlets dropped in the camp and the surrounding territory, one of these I personally read, which related to what was going on inside of the camp. These leaflets were scattered all over the countryside and must have been dropped from planes. They are in Polish and German. Under those circumstances, nobody could be at or near Auschwitz without knowing what was going on. So the British knew exactly what was happening at Auschwitz, but as POWs of Britain, they were given different treatment. Some were killed due to overwork and the conditions they were kept in. Days before Auschwitz was liberated by the Red Army, the British POWs were given different options by the German guards. They were told they could start walking east towards the Russians or west towards the Americans. This was in a sense a death march in the middle of the coldest winter Poland had seen in years. The temperature often went below minus 25 degrees and the men froze. Some even starved to death, many had to walk past the frozen bodies of Jews, many who had been shot by the Germans and many who had been killed by the conditions and the fact they were physically exhausted from the walk. The British POWs who had a coat on them shared them and at night they huddled together to keep off the cold. As they passed through towns, they also noticed the atrocities and slaughter conducted by the Germans and the Nazis who were now intent on fleeing back towards their homeland. The British were then liberated as they reached Regensburg, a city in East Bavaria. After the Brits arrived home in Britain, the war office told the relatives that the prisoners of war held at Auschwitz would be slightly odd for a while, coping with what they had seen inside the horrific camp. One British man wrote, My wife could never read these stories, I still have nightmares to this day. It took me eight years before I told her where I'd been. Their treatment by the British government whilst in captivity was even slightly harsh, as the men had their wages reduced as they were captured, and these deductions were worked out to pay for the fact their rifles fell into German hands. Later the German government paid £1 million in compensation for the treatment of the POWs at Auschwitz, but not one penny reached the British men held there. So the British prisoners who were held at Auschwitz were treated poorly, and despite things being much worse for Jewish prisoners, what these men saw stuck with them for the rest of their lives. Their treatment was far from ideal, but many of these men survived the war. A number of them were so haunted and distraught by their experiences inside of Auschwitz that many refused to talk about them for years and they believed the public and their family would not want to hear their stories. Some British were killed inside of Auschwitz, some by the air raid and these were buried alongside German soldiers but others were killed by the treatment and conditions they were being kept in. The British prisoners of Auschwitz were just some of the millions of people who walked through the barbed wire fences of the camp or who arrived on the train lines of the horrific camp. They, like so many who survived, were haunted for the rest of their lives by what they saw, but many were lucky being kept alive, purely on the basis of where they came from, and the fact they were British. Once again, thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.